And here's Elon Musk, surrounded by some of the biggest business leaders in the world, and he comes with this really out of left field idea, but he was willing to put himself out to the point that after the meeting, other business leaders were kind of poking fun privately amongst themselves about Elon coming in with this harebrained idea that he had. Well, you know what else was a harebrained idea? Tesla. SpaceX, you know, go down the list of these things that Elon Musk has been able to bring to fruition. And I think there's a little Trump in that too. Are you willing to do something that's gonna cost you something if it's the right thing to do? One of the early decisions that we had to make in the White House was, are we gonna move the US Embassy in Tel Aviv to Jerusalem? Every president since Ronald Reagan had promised to do it. We're gonna move the US Embassy to Jerusalem. We're gonna uh, we're gonna just, I, we're gonna acknowledge the fact that Jerusalem is the eternal capital of Israel. And we're gonna move our embassy there as a show of support for the Israelis and for that fact. And every single president prior to Trump reversed course and didn't do it, both Republican and Democrat. Hmm. And I know why. Why? Because I saw the same thing. I was, I was confronted with the same briefing that all of those other presidents got. You make this decision and it's gonna be mass chaos in the Middle East. People are going to lose their minds. Any hope for peace and stability in this region is gonna be gone by you doing that. Mm. And every president was confronted with this conundrum. Do I do what I said I was gonna do? Do I do this thing that's the right thing to do? Or do I allow myself to be convinced that it's actually I, sh I shouldn't do that because it's gonna cost lives or it's gonna infect our interest in some other way. Trump was confronted with the same briefing. And at some point he said, hold on just a second. I, I think everyone here is confused about there being a debate over whether we're going to do this. I promised I'm go I was gonna do it and we're doing it. So the conversation is over with, start executing on doing it. So the president makes this decision and um, he announces it. And after he announces it, uh, I'm standing with him in the outer oval, just outside the oval office. There's a little room where his assistants uh, sit there. Um, and he comes out because I'm getting ready to take him to the next meeting that we're go gonna go into. And he looks up and there's a TV on the wall. And every TV in the West Wing has four panels on it, split in four. It'll have Fox, CNN, MSNBC, and Fox Business. So you can see in one look, what's the coverage, what's everybody focused on, you know, traditional media-wise. Mm -hmm. at, a, at a moment's notice, you can see that all day. They don't have the Sean Ryan show streaming in there? They that? haven't got it streaming yet. You guys haven't gone 24-7 live yet. <laughs> we need to get a 24-7 live stream of your life and we can get it uh, put on the screens in the West Wing. We can make that happen. But he looks up on the screen and you can immediately see that every single panel is protests in the Middle East. There are people hanging him in effigy. There are people burning the American flag. There are people chanting, Trump, Trump, you will see. Palestine will be free. He is watching this unfold, and it's the most visceral hatred toward a person that you can imagine. I'm watching a giant Trump head get lit on fire mm -hmm. over there. I'm watching them stabbing hit, you know, Trump figure, things like that. Mm -hmm. The feeling that I had in that moment, I can only compare it to the same feeling that you might have if you see someone trip and fall on the sidewalk. My inclination is to look away because I don't want them to be embarrassed that I saw them fall. You know, when people fall and they look around and say, did anybody see that? I would rather like act like I didn't see it so that they don't feel embarrassed. Not that the president had done anything wrong, but I had this kind of embarrassed feeling of like, man, look what they're saying about the person standing right next to me. It's just su such visceral hatred. And I will never forget Trump's reaction to seeing that though. He watches it for a minute and then he looks at me and he goes, all right, what do we got next? Like what's next on our schedule today? Didn't even acknowledge this hatred, unimaginable level of hatred happening for the whole world to see directed at him personally. And it rolled off his back like water off of a duck's back. And I realized in that moment that Trump 
for all the things people can say about him, has a level of intestinal fortitude to do, if he thinks something is the right thing to do, and you may disagree with you know, him thinking that that is the right thing to do, you may have a difference of opinion there, but if he thinks this is the right thing to do, he will endure any amount of criticism, hatred directed at him if he thinks it's the right thing. And that's why I and a lot of others who worked in the White House would have crawled over broken glass for Trump uh, because that's a level of moral courage that we were around politicians all day and these squishes who are just like, see which way the wind blows. Oh, people mm -hmm. want me to go that way, I'm gonna go that way. Mm -hmm. And Trump wasn't like that. And it, it was really a, a rare thing to see among politicians for sure. I mean, that had to be, was that, was that an everyday occurrence for you? To see, I mean, things of that magnitude. That's what they, that's maybe what they not, covered but, for four years, more than four years. I mean, it's what started probably a year out. I remember, I remember watching on the news people shoving eggs in women's faces because they were they were going to vote for him. Yeah, and and it was just nasty. It was five years of this, yeah, at least, but, yeah. and it continues on today. But you know, so so none of that that stuff doesn't affect him, like. Kathy, Kathy Griffin, you know, what did she do? Oh, yeah, when Chopped she his head off uh, or yeah, held his head, severed head up, things like that, yeah. It doesn't affect him. With, I think it would surprise people because people, again, I think they have a little bit of a misconception of Trump because he, he's also someone who lets no slight go unanswered. You know, he'll, he'll attack someone on Twitter for some seemingly, you know, down in the weeds, like, why, you know, why are you raising that to the level of a response. So on one, on one hand, he's like, we'll punch any, anybody who's you know, mm -hmm. confronting him. And on the other hand, is willing to endure the kind of criticism that I'm talking about. So it is a, it's a dichotomy a little bit there, but there's some parts of it I think are a sport for him. The reason he would go after the host of Morning Joe or you know, whomever on Twitter, it's the game. Yeah. You can come after me, I'm gonna come after you. Let's play the game, let's go, let's do it. But on these issues of, of national security and international importance and things that impacted people's lives, I think he had the courage to do the right thing. You had mentioned a couple of big names that, that had meetings in the White House that sounds like maybe you were uh, previous to. Yeah. One of them being Jeff Bezos. What? Can you talk about those conversations? So the, yeah, at all? The, the the Bezos one was kind of innocuous. It was like a, he didn't spend a lot of time with Trump. He came in, I think it was for like one of the business councils that we had, you know, put together, and he was one of the people on there, and I'd met him and that kind of thing. The one that was that really stuck with me was the Elon Musk interactions, though, because um, we had a meeting in the cabinet room, and the president was uh, working on what to do on infrastructure. Uh, you know, crumbling infrastructure all over the country. What am I going to do? I'm going to bring together all these people I knew from the private sector who can help bring up fresh eyes to this problem and come with them interesting ideas. So he had a lot of his friends there who were big builders who had done, you know, giant projects, built skyscrapers, all these things. Like, what are we going to do about American infrastructure? And one of the people was, was Elon Musk. So we're going around the room and people are talking about the things you would expect with infrastructure, ports, Bridges, roads, airports, obviously important things. We get to Elon Musk, and Elon wants to talk about a tunnel that would take people. All these people are in one room at the same oh, time? Oh yeah, all in, all in the cabinet room of the White House. Yeah, all around a, the giant table, the president sits in the middle. Fascinating. The, the back of his chair in the cabinet room, if you ever look at pictures, the back of the president's chair is about that much taller than every other chair in the room, so you can see which chair is the president's. Um, so the same meetings or same room where we'd have cabinet meetings, we would bring in private sector leaders and things like that, and the president would use it as like a giant conference room, just like you used to see on The Apprentice when the president sitting at a, or, or Trump would sit at a table and the and people would kind of surround the table around him and kind of go around the room. He would do the same thing with private sector leaders, and so we get to Elon, and Elon says, um, "I I think I can get people." from New York City to Washington, D.C. in 29 minutes. And we can do it via a tunnel, hyperloop system. And he's kind of explaining this whole, the whole thing. And Trump kind of leans back in his chair and he goes, 
Elon, you know, this guy's talking about bridges. This guy's talking about tunnels. I mean, you're talking about bridges. He's talking about roads. And this guy comes, he says, I've got a tunnel. I'm going to bring a tunnel. You know, he starts doing this whole thing, like a Trump riff on like, I can't believe you're bringing a tunnel in here. Uh, and Trump goes, you know what, Elon? That sounds great. Why don't you just do it? Let's just do it. And uh, it was just kind of a funny, awkward moment where everybody's like looking around the room, like, did the president just approve a tunnel from New York City to Washington, D.C.? Does he have the authority to approve a tunnel from New York to Washington, D.C.? I don't really know. But the thing that I always, that stuck with me about that with Elon Musk is the things that you are able to do in life are often directly proportionate to the amount of criticism and ridicule that you're willing to take for doing them. And here's Elon Musk, surrounded by some of the biggest business leaders in the world, and he comes with this really out of left field idea. And look, I don't know anything about the idea. Like, maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work. But he was willing to put himself out to the point that after the meeting, other business leaders were kind of poking fun privately amongst themselves about Elon coming in with this harebrained idea that he had. Well, you know what else was a harebrained idea? Tesla, SpaceX. You know, go down the list of these things that Elon Musk has been able to bring to fruition. And, and I think there's a little Trump in that, too. Uh, going back to him being willing to endure all the criticism on the, all the decisions that he made. Like, I find myself wanting to explain myself a lot when people misunderstand me or, or criticize one of the, some of the things that I have done or said publicly or whatever, because I want to say, no, 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 uh, hear me out. Like, I, I have good intentions here. I'm trying to do the right thing. Let me tell you why I think that. And I think that that can come, become debilitating if you spend all your time wanting to be understood by people where if you're going to truly do anything of, of any magnitude and significance, you're going to make enemies, you're going to have critics, and if you spend all your time trying to, oh, no, 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 please understand me, you're not going to be able to keep a relentless focus on the mission, on the thing that you're trying to accomplish. And I think Elon has proven a, an ability to focus on the mission in the midst of people sniping at him left and right that I found really stuck with me after I left the White House, seeing him not just endure that from the public, but even from his peers, so to speak, of like these big business leaders uh, yeah. in the cabinet room. Interesting. Very interesting. No matter where you're watching Sean Ryan show from, if you get anything out of this, please like, comment, subscribe, and most importantly, share this everywhere you possibly can. And if you're feeling extra generous, please leave us a review on Apple and Spotify podcasts.